I've noticed that there are some wonderful faces in the audience uh, that I don't recognize. And so I believe that you're from, isn't that nice? Um, <laughs> it was not planned. I believe that you're from some schools in the area. Are you, where are you from? From Rancho, from Rancho? where else? Where are you from? Piner, long distance. Great. Terrific, thank you for coming. Where else? Where are you from? Rancho. Rancho. Anybody else here from Rancho? Terrific. Thank you very much for coming. I think you're going to have an enjoyable experience. Um, some announcements first. You know that uh, in addition to this being Holocaust Remembrance Week, it's Earn Some Extra Credit Week. <laughs> and so I'd like to remind you Is that from us? It was. It was from us? It was our music, Allison? Was it our music? Oh, it's with the DVD. All semester I've been trying to play music as you came in to set you in a mood, and it hasn't worked. And that's why I have this astounded look on my face. OK. The first uh, thing that I would like to remind you of is the walk to end genocide. We have a team Sonoma. The money is collecting very fast. If you cannot make the walk, uh, you can go to the website and donate money if you prefer. Uh, but there's still, people are still being signed up, right? Will they be able to get t-shirts? Um, Okay, so if you put it off as soon as possible if you'd like to have um, a t-shirt. And then on Wednesday at Congregation Shomre Torah, which is um, on, uh, where is it, Barb? Bennett Valley. Bennett Valley. There is going to be a genocide commemoration, which is always held um, in the month of April, um, as you know, because April is of course, the cruelest month, um, and associated with uh, too many genocides. Then on Sunday at Congregation Bethany in Santa Rosa, there will be the community-wide Yom HaShoah, which is the commemoration of the Holocaust. Um, students who go to this always talk about how um, meaningful it is uh, experience. It's the one that I'll be at, and um, I hope some of you can come. You'll get a chance to meet Lillian again, as well as uh, be a part of the commemoration of the Holocaust. Okay. I wish I had better news about how excited we were to have Hillary Eddie Stippelman with us. We're still very excited, but unfortunately, it does not include either the sapling or the exhibit. Um, at quite the last minute, we found out that the US Department of Agriculture did not want anybody except the caretaker to be near the tree. So they said that we could not have what we had planned to be a mock dedication, bring the tree out, say how wonderful it looks in bloom, and then put it back in uh, quarantine until December of this year when it officially will have gone through its third blooming and its third year in uh, quarantine. So you're all going to have to come back next year so that you can participate in the uh, dedication. 
probably, not probably, we'll probably bring the exhibit next year too. Um, and there will be opportunities for not only students but people in the community to act as docents and hopefully Hillary you'll be back next year to help us learn how to help people learn about Anne Frank. Um, Hillary Steppelman is the um, program manager for the Anne Frank Center USA. And the center offers a wide range of education programs that allow visitors to explore Anne's personal story alongside the history of World War II and the Holocaust and the need to identify and challenge prejudice. Individual empowerment and personal choice are central themes throughout AFC programming as it is essential for every person, every member of society to recognize the importance of personal responsibility in confronting prejudice and to actively promote values of diversity and social justice. Through examining the progression of historical events that led up to such tragedies as slavery, the Holocaust, wars, and currently terrorism, the programs at the center help ensure that we continue to help our audi their audience, that they would like to help their audience, become well equipped to act as leaders in, the challenging, in challenging discrimination, intolerance, and uh, bias, violence, in positive and constructive ways. And we've talked all along this semester about that as one of our goals in this series. And I think that this is, uh, makes us a fine match for the Anne Frank Center. Anne once said, wrote rather, we have many reasons to do, we have many reasons to hope for great happiness, but we have to earn it. And that's something you can't do by taking the easy way out. Earning happiness means doing good and working. So we are most pleased to welcome Hillary to our, uh, as she said, beautiful campus and to learn more about Anne Frank. So would you join me in greeting Hillary Eddie Steffen? Ah, yes. My. Uh, personal assistant has uh, said that I would like to remind you, please, to turn your cell phones off. We generally meant, mean that not for our students, because they all know the penalty for having their cell phones on during lecture, but it is meant for our outside audience who often don't understand that there are great penalties involved in having your cell phone. <laughs> would you agree, Hillary? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me out to Sonoma State University. I'm really thrilled to be here. And uh, despite the fact that we are unable to plant the Anne Frank sapling this year, I am, as Myrna said, looking forward to returning here next year uh, when we will undoubtedly be planting the sapling and of course, uh, installing the Anne Frank exhibit as well. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the center and about the history of Anne Frank's story, um, followed by a short documentary film that I think will really help contextualize what Anne was going through for you, and uh, finish up with some brief remarks, and then I'd really like to open it up to all of you for questions, comments, and discussion. Um, so I will go ahead and get started. Y'all can hear me well enough with the mic? Okay. So the Anne Frank Center USA, where I work, is in New York City. We were founded in 1977 by Otto Frank, Anne's father, along with a group of local volunteers in New York City, many of whom were and um, continue to be involved in the center very actively as, as Holocaust survivors. 
And the idea was that the Anne Frank Center USA would sort of become the North American branch of the Anne Frank House and, and carry out the house's mission. Since then, the center has actually grown into a much larger organization, and we have a newly opened ground floor space in Lower Manhattan, which we actually just uh, opened on, on March 15th of this year, just two blocks north of the World Trade Center site. And we're really thrilled to, uh, to be in Lower Manhattan during this time of, of cultural rebuilding and, and regrowth. I think it's a wonderful opportunity for us, uh, in addition to the fact that right across the street from us, is Park 51, which is the Ground Zero Mosque, as it has come to be called by the media. And we've already begun uh, partnering with the staff there, offering joint education programs, and, and their imam was actually one of the guest speakers at our press conference and opening in March. So we're really thrilled to be working with them and you know, actively helping to uh, sort of support each other in our missions and our, our joint undertakings. Now, in addition to carrying out the Anne Frank House's mission, we are also involved in developing our own programs, exhibitions, and several unique annual events, including the Spirit of Anne Frank Awards, which are held each year on Anne's birthday, which is June 12th, to honor worthy students, educators, and citizens who work towards Anne's hope of engendering <coughs> understanding, equality, and mutual respect among diverse groups. And I would encourage anyone who knows of an outstanding educator, student, or citizen to please visit our website. Um, the deadline for this year has passed, unfortunately, but if you are interested in nominating someone, the forms are available on our website, which is www.annefrank.com. The center's mission to advance the legacy of Anne Frank by teaching the lessons of her time to young people and communities is carried out through our traveling exhibits, uh, the professional development programs that we offer for educators, uh, arts residencies for school groups, on-site ed programs, and we also seek to educate the public on the consequences of intolerance and the need to identify and challenge prejudice through a variety of programs that teach literacy, history, and of course, personal empowerment, which it sounds like you all have been focusing on pretty heavily in this course this semester. This year celebrates the 60th anniversary of the first publication of Anne Frank's diary here in the US. Originally published in Holland in 1947, the diary of a young girl was brought to the US when Judith Jones, who at that time was a young intern at a publishing house in Paris, came across the manuscript in a pile of proposals that she was instructed to send rejection letters to. And after spending most of the evening at the office reading Anne's story of hope, humor, and love in the face of despair, she brought the manuscript to her boss the next morning and pleaded with him to please give a voice to this amazing young writer. Since then, the diary has sold more than 40 million copies worldwide and has been published in 68 different languages. Anne's diary is one of the most widely read works of nonfiction in the world and her legacy will continue to grow here at Sonoma State University through the Anne Frank Sapling Project. I just want to speak a little bit more about that so you all understand what's going to be happening with the Anne Frank Center's traveling exhibit program. We coordinate the tour of several different exhibits that are put together by uh, Amsterdam and one of those exhibits, Anne Frank and History for Today, which was scheduled to be installed this year, has been delayed and will be installed next year here at Sonoma State University in the library, we hope. Um, and it was, it's part of the planned events that are surrounding the planting of the Anne Frank sapling, which was awarded to the school in 2009. Now, why, you ask, if the tree was awarded in 2009, is it still not in the ground? The answer is because uh, apparently chestnut trees carry some sort of mold weeping sore virus, I'm not sure what the scientific name of it is, that has become pretty rampant throughout Europe. And they actually are no longer allowed to bring horse chestnut trees into the United States. Uh, we had to get special permission to bring the, uh, the saplings from the Anne Frank tree into this country and they're being held very, very strictly by the U.S. Department of Agriculture and being watched very closely for any signs of this disease. 
Um, we're very lucky to have been able to bring these 11 saplings over, and uh, they ended up, in fact, being the last saplings that will probably ever be imported from Europe. Um, the, uh, the sapling that Sonoma State received is kind of unique in that it's being fostered here while under quarantine by the staff of Sonoma State University. Most of the rest of them are being fostered by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Uh, and this is one of only 11 saplings which will be planted all over the U.S. next year to commemorate Anne Frank and help to share her legacy with the communities throughout the country. Um, some of the other sites receiving saplings include the Children's Museum of Indianapolis, Little Rock Central High School, Boston Common, and the September 11th Memorial in New York City. Each of these sites has a strong history of combating racism and intolerance through education. And all of the sites will be brought together online through a new website, which is currently under development, that will allow visitors to learn more about Anne and her connection to the chestnut tr tree that she watched through the window of the secret annex throughout her time in hiding. The website will provide a platform for discussion and encourage everyone to share their own connections to nature and to these 11 very special chestnut trees. So, who is Anne Frank? I'm sure you all know who Anne is and have heard pieces and, and parcels of, of her story, so I will attempt to fill in some of the lesser known details before we start the video. Annalise Marie Frank, known to the world as Anne Frank, was born on June 12, 1929, the second daughter of Otto and Edith Frank in Frankfurt am Main, Germany. Anne and her older sister Margot were born in the post-World War I era, and they, along with their parents, were German citizens under the laws of the Weimar Republic, which was established following Germany's uh, pretty heavy loss in World War I. The Frank family emphasized the importance of education and instilled in both girls a deep cultural appreciation, particularly for German literature and art. The Frank family of German Jewish heritage had friends of many different faiths and nationalities. In 1929, the year Anne was born, the New York City Stock Exchange crashed and an already very unstable Weimar government was further undermined by economic depression, unemployment, and the very severe inflation of the German mark. We actually have images in one of our exhibits that show people in Germany during this time traveling to their local grocery store with wheelbarrows, and the wheelbarrows are full of paper German marks, because in order for people just to buy groceries, you needed a stack of bills like this. So that is to give you a sense of how inflated the German currency had become. Under this very difficult situation, extremist parties started to gain very strong support and the National Socialist Party, headed by Adolf Hitler, spoke out promising bread and work as well as to right the perceived wrongs in the Treaty of Versailles. And as you all I'm sure remember from high school social studies, the Treaty of Versailles is, is what was signed at the end of World War I, forcing Germany, first of all, to completely disarm, to not have a standing army, and also to pay very, very hefty war reparations to the countries who were victorious in World War I. So, as you can well imagine, this treaty was considered by the German people and completely unfair document and was playing a very a large role in, in bankrupting the country. In addition to this, anti-Semitism was also central to Nazi ideology, and Hitler's worldview saw the domination of what he termed Aryan people over subhumans, or inferior peoples. In particular, he labeled Jews, Slavs, the Roma and the Sinti people, who are often referred to as gypsies, handicapped homosexuals, and other people of disabilities as subhuman, as less than a regular human being. Now, at first, many German Jews felt that Nazism was a passing phenomenon, while others, including the Frank family, attempted to leave Germany altogether. In 1933, as the Nazis came into full power, the Franks decided eventually to move to Amsterdam, which had the reputation of being a safe haven for religious minorities, and as you recall, remained neutral during World War I. 
Like the fate of so many other refugees throughout Europe during World War II, the Franks' belief that they were safe was shattered when the Nazi armies violated Dutch neutrality and invaded the Netherlands in May of 1940. The Nazi administration in the Netherlands, along with the Dutch Nazi party and the civil service, began issuing and carrying out the anti-Jewish legal, legal and administrative decrees that stripped all Jews of their rights as citizens and human beings, as well as seeking to isolate them from their fellow Dutch citizens. Otto Frank, aware of what the Nazi decrees had done to Jews in Germany, anticipated as best he could what was going to happen, and he actually Aryanized his business, which means giving it over to white Christian owners as opposed to non-white or non-Christian owners ahead of time. And he gave it to his colleagues, Victor Kugler and Johannes Kleinman, who will reappear in the story later on. In addition, Anne had to leave her Montessori school and was forced to attend the Jewish Lyceum. She writes during this time, our freedom was severely restricted by a series of anti-Jewish decrees. Jews were required to wear a yellow star. Jews were forbidden to use streetcars. Jews were forbidden to ride in cars, even their own. Jews were required to do their shopping between 3 and 5 p.m. Jews were required to frequent only Jewish-owned barbershops and beauty parlors. We were forbidden out on the streets between 8 p.m. and 6 a.m. Jews were forbidden to visit Christians in their own homes. Jews were required to attend Jewish-only schools. You couldn't do this, and you couldn't do that, but life went on. When Anne Frank wrote that passage, a spirited young girl at the age of 13, she had no way of knowing that for her and for three out of four Dutch Jews, life would, in fact, not go on. On July 5th of 1942, Anne's sister Marga received a call-up notice for the Nazi work camp. Even though the hiding place behind Otto Frank's office building was not yet ready, Edith and Otto Frank realized that they had to escape immediately. They hurriedly packed their belongings and left notes implying that they had fled the country to Switzerland. And on July 6th, they arrived at their hiding place, known to us through Anne's diary as the secret annex. Anne writes, so there we were, father, mother, and I, walking in the pouring rain, each of us with a school bag and a shopping bag filled to the brim with the most varied assortment of items. The people on their way at that early hour gave us sympathetic looks. You could tell by their face that they were sorry they couldn't offer us some kind of transportation or assistance. But the conspicuous yellow star spoke for itself. Otto Frank had made arrangements with his business partner, also a German Jew, Jewish refugee named Hermann van Peltz and his wife Gusti, as well as their son Peter, to share the annex with his family. The Van Peltz family arrived a week later on July 13th, and the seven residents of the annex were joined by an eighth and final resident, Fritz Pfeffer, in November. Anne wrote about her new home. The annex is an ideal place to hide in. It may be damp and lopsided, but there's probably not a more comfortable hiding place in all of Amsterdam. No, in all of Holland. So Anne is realizing right away how lucky she is to be hiding in what was essentially a small apartment compared to many people whose stories that we've heard that are hidden you know, in basements, in closets, on, in farms, attics, even in holes in the ground. So Anne is, is exceptionally lucky in this case, not only to be in a relatively comfortable surroundings, but also with her parents and her family. Although Anne might not have told you how lucky she was to be hiding with her parents for two years. <laughs> Most families who went into hiding were split up and were moved from place to place, dependent on others for help. And many parents did try to place at least their children in hiding, thinking that they would be safer split up. And of the children who did survive the war, very few ever saw their families again. Since the secret annex was above a business and the buildings on either side were occupied, the eight residents had to be extremely quiet during the day so that they would not be discovered. 
They became a kind of extended family in the confined space of the shared rooms. And in her diary, Anne records the quarrels and celebrations of this life in hiding, along with their constant dread of discovery and arrest. Meanwhile, the Nazis and their collaborators were carrying out their plan for what had come to be known as the final solution to the Jewish question. Anne and her family learn how the Nazis are carrying out their plan during visits from the four office workers, who include Mr. Kugler and Mr. Kleinman, who are now helping to hide these eight people in the office building. After one such visit, Anne writes, night after night, green and gray military vehicles cruise the street. They knock on every door, asking whether any Jews live there. If so, the whole family is immediately taken away. If not, they proceed to the next house. It's impossible to escape their clutches unless you go into hiding. They often go around with lists, knocking only on those doors where they know there's a big haul to be made. They frequently offer a bounty, so much per head. It's like the slave hunts of the olden days. At this point, the annex residents could only wait and hope. Anne conveys in her diary the long hours of boredom and suffocation that she was experiencing. She writes, let me out where there's fresh air and laughter. A voice within me cries for freedom. I'm gonna pause here and uh, start the video and we'll come back to discuss it. It's about 25 minutes long. These words have been painted on the wall of the school she went to. A year after making this entry, Anne Frank was killed because she was Jewish. Anne was 15 years old. She wasn't the only Jewish pupil in her class. We might also tell stories of her 15 Jewish classmates, their arrests or hiding, hunger, sickness or death. But we know Anne Frank's story so well because she wrote it down herself. I hope I will be able to confide everything to you, as I have never been able to confide in anyone. And I hope you will be a great source of comfort and support. Anna Frank, 12th of June, 1942. Anne Frank began her diary on her 13th birthday. Most of it she wrote during her two years in hiding. The place where she hid is still there. It's now a museum called the Anne Frank House. People from all around the world come to see it, as well as Anne's diary, which is exhibited. June the 12th, 1929, Anne Frank is born. Her sister Margot is three years older. Her mother, Edith, takes care of the home and family. Her father, Otto, works in a bank. They live in Frankfurt in Germany. Anne and her family are German Jews. Sometimes they go to the local synagogue. Anne and Margot often play with the other children in their neighborhood. Life is good. In 1933, an anti-Semitic political party comes to power, people who hate Jews. Their leader is Adolf Hitler. The party is called the National Socialists. Its members are called Nazis. Germany is a poor country, and Hitler has promised to help the people to rise to their former glory. He wants Germans to be proud of their country. As he sees it, they need to unite under a strong leader because they're being threatened by enemies. According to the Nazis, the Jews are Germany's greatest enemy. They portray Jews as dangerous. Since time immemorial, the Jews have been blamed for other people's problems. This makes it easier for many Germans to believe what Hitler tells them. When 
the Nazis take power, they go straight to work. They start arresting anyone with ideas different to their own and put them in prison camps. They burn books by Jews and political opponents. They introduce many anti-Jewish laws. They have Jewish teachers and civil servants fired from their jobs. Jewish students must sit apart in classrooms. Nazis also discriminate against gypsies, homosexuals, and the disabled. They prevent people from shopping in Jewish-owned stores. The Nazis are everywhere. It's getting dangerous for Jews. Anne's parents no longer want to live in Germany. Her father gets the chance to start up a company in the Netherlands, and they decide to leave. In this way, the Frank family comes to Amsterdam. Anne is almost five years old. Their house is in a new neighborhood in Amsterdam, and Anne soon feels at home there. She goes to school and learns Dutch. She has Dutch and German friends to play with, because she's not the only German Jewish refugee in her neighborhood. Sometimes Anne accompanies her father to work. Otto Frank's company is called Opecta. There, they make an ingredient for making jam. Otto makes a film to advertise his product. In it, Mief Heath, one of Otto's employees, shows how to use Opecta. Otto has to work hard. He isn't home much. Anne's mother is homesick for Germany. She writes often to her friends and family. She'd like to go back, but she knows that's not possible. Life is getting worse and worse for the Jews there. Now, Jews may not own businesses. They may not marry non-Jews. In fact, the Nazis want just one thing, to get rid of all Jews. In November of 1938, Germans lash out at the Jews, destroying synagogues, Jewish homes, and shops. We now call it Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass. Jews are beaten and arrested. Those that can leave. But many countries refuse them entry. Anne's grandmother comes to Amsterdam. She's 73. They all hope to be safe here. Hitler and the Nazis now want power over all of Europe. They build more and more weapons. In 1939, the German army invades Poland. England and France join the fight because they are allies. The Second World War has begun. On the 10th of May, 1940, the German army invades the Netherlands. It is so powerful that it occupies the Netherlands in just five days. Still, the Dutch army manages to fight back until the Germans bomb Rostock. After the bombardment, there is nothing left of Rotterdam city centre. When the German army threatens to bomb other cities in the same way, the Dutch choose to surrender. The Nazis are now in power in the Netherlands. What they did in Germany, they can now do here too. In the meantime, the German army has invaded and conquered Belgium and France. They have closed all the borders. Escape is almost impossible. At first, the German occupation doesn't seem all that bad. Anne and Margot can go anywhere they like. Not much has changed. Anne lives on Merveda Square in South Amsterdam. One time she's caught on film. It's the only film of her in existence. A young woman in her apartment building is getting married. The wedding couple and family come outside. People are watching from their windows and on the street. Anne is leaning out of her window. It almost looks like she's saying, hey, I'm being filmed.
few months later, Anne and Margot are forced to go to a new school, the Jewish grammar school. Jewish children may no longer attend school together with non-Jewish children. Slowly but surely, the Nazis go about limiting the Jews' freedom. First, they may not work for the government. Then, they must hand over their companies to the Nazis. Then, they must carry identification papers stamped with a big J. Now, they can't even go out and be in the same place with other people. Now, they must wear a yellow star so everyone can see they're Jewish. On her 13th birthday, Anne receives a diary. She's very happy with it and starts writing in it immediately. Sunday, 14th of June, 1942. I still have a lot to tell you. I'll begin from the moment I got you, the moment I saw you lying on the table. Anne treats her new diary like a friend. She has no idea that in three weeks she will never be able to see her real friends ever again. She will have to go into hiding. It all happens on a Sunday. Anne is sitting in the sun, reading. Someone rings the doorbell. It's the postman with a registered letter for Margot. She is being ordered to report for work duty in Germany. But this isn't just any work order. Everyone knows if Margot goes to Germany, she'll probably never be heard of again. But if she doesn't report, the police will come after her and punish her whole family too. I was stunned. A call-up. Everyone knows what that means. Visions of concentration camps and lonely cells raced through my head. Anne's parents saw it coming. They had already planned to hide from the Nazis, and they decided that the time had come. The next morning, Meep Kies comes to pick Margot up. They get on their bicycles and ride away together. Then Anne leaves with her parents. They take as many clothes and other things as they can without looking conspicuous. The walk takes an hour. Anne's father explains that the hiding place is behind his company building. It's in the centre of town near the Western Church. The front part houses the company offices and storage areas, but behind that there's another house, a secret annex, where they can hide. The office workers already know their plans. Meep Hees, Bert Vosko, Victor Kukler, and Jo Kleinman have been helping Anne's father to furnish the hiding place. They have promised to provide them with food and any supplies they might need. That's dangerous. People who are caught helping the Jews are severely punished. Ten days later, another family joins them. Hermann von Pels has been Otto's co-director in the business. He and his wife, Rusty, have been regular guests at the Frank home for years. Their son, Peter, doesn't particularly impress Anne. She finds him shy and a little dull. The hiding place in the secret annex has two stories and an attic. The Frank family lives on the lower floor in two rooms. One is for Otto and Edith, the other is for Margot and Anne. Above them, is a large room where Herman and Rusty Van Pelt sleep. This also serves as the dining room and kitchen for the whole group. Peter has his own room next to them. The stairs lead to the attic, which is used for storage. Of course, we are not allowed to look out of the window at all, or to go outside. Also, we have to do everything softly in case they hear us below. And then I'm really afraid that we'll be discovered and shot. Their hiding place must always remain a secret. Their neighbours at the back must never see them, so they hang curtains at the windows and always keep them closed. The building's ground floor is a warehouse and runs from the back garden all the way to the street. The people working there must never suspect what's happening right above their heads. This is a problem as the walls and floors are very thin, so the families in hiding have to be completely quiet during the day. The door to the secret annex is hidden behind a bookcase, hanging on hinges. 
The people in hiding are relieved that Margot didn't report for transport to Germany, especially when they hear about what happens to Jews who don't hide or escape. Our many Jewish friends are being taken away in droves. The Gestapo is treating them very roughly and transporting them in cattle trucks to Westerbork, the big camp for Jews in Drenthe. Escape is almost impossible. If it's that bad in Holland, what must it be like in those far away and uncivilized places where the Germans are sending them? We assume that most of them are being murdered. The English radio says they're being gassed. Perhaps that's the quickest way to die. I feel terrible. In November, another person joins the group in hiding. His name is Fritz Pfeffer, a long-time acquaintance of the family. He's given a bed in Anne's room. Margot will now have to sleep in her parents' room. Anne is not happy about Fritz Pfeffer. He is strict, and he often scolds her if she does something wrong. And then he goes and tells Anne's mother. They argue often. In fact, the others have arguments as well. After all, it's very hard for eight people to live together in such close quarters, and always with the fear of being caught hanging over them. Pfeffer describes to them how the Nazis and their helpers close off entire streets and then force all the Jews out of their own homes, including children, the elderly, and the sick. For weeks now, he says, the Nazis have been rounding up thousands of Jews and sending them to Westerbork transit camp. From there, they are taken in cattle trains to Eastern Europe. Their homes and shops are ransacked, and entire streets fall still. Anne has a friend, Sana, in Westerbork. Six months later, another friend, Hannah Lee, will be taken away. Anne feels guilty. I feel wicked sleeping in a warm bed, while somewhere out there my dearest friends are dropping from exhaustion or being knocked to the ground, all because they're Jews. Anne shivers with fear when she hears that Reuter, the German chief of police, has announced that all Jews must be removed from the Netherlands by July 1st, 1943. In secret, the Nazis have decided to kill as many Jews as they can. But Anne also feels encouraged when she hears that people are resisting the occupation force. Resistance fighters in Amsterdam have set fire to the city's board of records. This will make it much harder for the police to track down the Jews. The radio updates the people in hiding about developments abroad. Armies from a number of different countries are trying to push the Nazis back. In July 1943, Allied armies defeat the German army in North Africa. British, Canadian and US troops land in Sicily. The German army is now surrounded. The Russians are attacking from the east. And from the west, British and American air forces fly bombing raids every night over Germany. From her room, Anne can hear them passing overhead. The number of airstrikes on German cities is increasing daily. We haven't had a good night's rest in ages, and I have bags under my eyes from lack of sleep. Factories, even entire cities have been leveled. Amsterdam is bombed as well. This time, the British Air Force tried to bomb an aircraft factory, but the bombs fell on a residential neighborhood, and all just a few miles from the secret annex. The destruction seems to be terrible. Whole streets lie in ruins. It still makes me shiver to think of the dull, distant drone that signified the approaching destruction. The Western Church just a block away from the secret annex, is an important building in Amsterdam. 
In the summer of 1943, the fire department makes a film to show how they can protect it if necessary. You can just make out the secret annex in the picture. Maybe Anne was writing in her diary at that very moment. Wednesday, 23rd of February, 1944. Dearest Kitty, this morning, when I went to the attic again, Peter was busy clearing up. He finished quickly and came over to where I was sitting on my favourite spot on the floor. He stood and I sat. We breathed in the air, looked outside, and both felt that the spell shouldn't be broken with words. I knew then that he was a good, decent boy. The two of them spend a lot of time together. But after a few months, Anne doesn't feel as in love as she used to, and she distances herself from Peter. Instead, she spends more time with her diary. Wednesday, 29th of March, 1944. Dear Kitty, Last night, Mr. Bockerstein, the cabinet minister, speaking on the Dutch broadcast from London, said that after the war, a collection will be made of diaries and letters dealing with the war. Of course, everyone pounced on my diary. Just imagine how interesting it would be if I were to publish a novel about the secret annex. The title alone would make people think it was a detective story. Anne starts rewriting everything on separate sheets of paper, all for her new book. Tuesday, 6th of June, 1944. Dearest Kitty, this is the day the English news announced at 12 o'clock. And quite rightly, this is the day the invasion has begun. The German army is not expecting this invasion. The Allies are strong, but their advance is painfully slow. The German army fights back hard. Only when the Allies have established a beachhead will they be able to gain ground. Anne's father, Otto, keeps a map of Normandy on the wall. On it, he charts the Allied advance. Every day, every hour, they listen for the latest news on the radio. Would the long-awaited liberation ever come true? Oh, Kitty. The best part of the invasion is that I have the feeling that friends are approaching. Anne and Margot hope they'll be able to go back to school in October. They're already making plans for the future. Margot wants to become a maternity nurse. Anne wants to be a writer and journalist. While rewriting old pages in her diary, Anne continues to add new ones. She starts thinking more and more about herself and the world around her. It's twice as hard for us young people to hold on to our opinions at a time when ideals are being shattered and destroyed, when the worst side of human nature predominates, when everyone has come to doubt truth, justice and God. It's a wonder I haven't abandoned all my ideals. They seem so absurd and impractical. Yet I cling to them because I still believe, in spite of everything, that people are truly good at heart. It's utterly impossible for me to build my life on a foundation of chaos, suffering and death. Anne would never get to see the peace. The Allied forces are approaching Paris when on August the 4th, 1944, someone phones the German police in Amsterdam with the message, there are Jews hiding at number 263 Prinzenkracht. Immediately, an SS officer drives to the building accompanied by Dutch policemen. They march in through the warehouse and climb the stairs to the offices. The staff are taken by surprise and cannot do anything. Jo Kleinman and Victor Kukler are arrested. The police walk on through to the annex and arrest all those in hiding. They're taken to prison. Bert Fosco and Miep Gies are left behind. Later that day, they have a look in the annex. The police have ransacked the place looking for anything of value. In among the mess, Meep finds Anne's diary and other papers and decides to keep them for when Anne returns. <coughs> After her arrest, Anne Frank is moved from one concentration camp to another. 
She starts off with the others at the Vesterborg transit camp. A month later, following a three day long trip without food or water, they end up at Auschwitz, the enormous extermination camp in Poland. After almost two months, Anne and Margaret are sent to Bergen-Belsen. She survives there for another five months until she finally succumbs to hunger, cold, exhaustion and sickness in March 1945. Just a few weeks later, the English liberate Bergen-Belsen. By that time, though, there are more dead people there than living. Margot always stays with Anne until she dies of typhus just before her little sister. Anne's mother dies of hunger and exhaustion in Auschwitz. Gusti van Pelt dies during transport to Theresienstadt. Hermann van Pelt dies in the gas chamber in Auschwitz. Peter van Pelt dies in Mauthausen. On May the 5th, 1945, Fritz Pfeffer dies in the Neuengamme work camp. Only Otto Frank would survive the ordeal. Of the 107,000 Dutch Jews deported to the concentration camps, only 5,000 survived. In May of 1945, the German army surrendered. The war is over, the Nazis have been defeated. In June of 1945, Otto Frank returns to the Netherlands. Victor Kukla and Jo Kleinert have survived their arrest. After Otto hears what has happened to his wife and children, Meep gives him Anne's diary. He reads everything she has written, including her wish to turn her diary into a book. He collates all her notes and he publishes her diary. By doing this, he fulfills his daughter's wish to become a writer. Even knowing what happens at the end of Anne's story, this is still a very difficult video to watch. Even for me, who you know, I must have watched this thing hundreds of times now, and I still get tears in my eyes listening to Otto Frank speak about getting to know his little girl for the first time after her death as he reads her diary. And you probably noticed as Otto Frank was speaking that he actually spoke English pretty well for a German guy. And the reason for that is because Otto Frank actually lived here in the United States for a few months prior to his wedding uh, with Edith. He became friendly with a gentleman named Nathan Strauss while the two of them were in graduate school for business. 
and ended up coming to New York to uh, basically do a professional internship, which was very common back then. And Nathan Strauss's family was involved in the much larger corporation called Macy Bamberger and Strauss. Today, it's just called Macy's, which I'm sure you all have heard of. That is the company where Otto Frank was working. And so after he left New York, he stayed in touch with Nathan Strauss. And uh, a few years later, when the National Socialist Party became very powerful in Germany, he actually wrote to Nathan Strauss and said, it's not safe here anymore. We need to get out. We'd very much like to immigrate to the United States. Can you help my family? And of course, Otto Frank is, is very cognizant of, of, of what's happening and, and doesn't just want to sit and, and wait and see. So Nathan Strauss writes back, of course, I'll, I'll do anything I can to help you. He actually offers to pay for the family's transatlantic voyage, which you know back then you couldn't just uh, hop on a plane and, and be over the Atlantic in a few hours. You actually had to go on a huge steam vessel, and it took weeks and weeks, and it was very expensive to come here. Um, and, and says, look, I'll, I'll see what I can do. So during this time, Nathan Strauss, you know, his family is very wealthy and actually has connections as high up as the U.S. State Department. So, you know, right beneath uh, the president. But despite all of the connections, despite all of the wealth, despite all of the best intentions, the Frank family is still told, along with hundreds and thousands of other Jewish families that are trying to come to this country, we're very sorry, the United States has an immigration quota in place. We do not have room for you right now. Please try again next year. And of course, for Otto Frank, there was no next year. They had to go into hiding as soon as Margot received her call-up notice. And at that point, the borders were locked down. Nobody could come or go without fake papers and, and a whole lot of, of risk. And at that point, if you weren't in hiding, you were done. So I bring this up because I think this is a very, very important part of teaching this period in history, not only to tell Anne's story and, and her experience in Europe, but so often the question that gets asked is, is how could this happen? How, how is this allowed to happen? And for our part here in the United States, unfortunately, we didn't get involved until Pearl Harbor. Before that, the United States was struggling itself. Of course, we were going through the Great Depression. I spoke about the stock market crash. And even though we were on the winning side of World War I, that war still took a tremendous toll on this country. And the result was that for many people and, and for our Congress, helping ourselves came first. And people felt that bringing immigrants into this country was going to further uh, undermine the very fragile economic situation that existed in the U.S. And as a result, this is where this quota came from. And, you know, when I talk about this with students at the Anne Frank Center, I ask, and I'll, I'll ask everyone here today as well, how many of you would not be sitting in this room right now had your parents or your parents or your great-grandparents not been allowed to immigrate here? I know I wouldn't be. Probably almost every single person in this room has a relative that immigrated to this country. And so for us to think about the potential of not being able to come here is not something that, that we really consider in this day and age. And, and traditionally, when we think of the United States, we think of it as that you know very open arms, come on in and have a piece of the American dream type of reception. But in this point in our history, that was really not at all the message that this country was sending. Um, in addition to what happened in World War II, we also, of course, now need to talk about the genocide known as the Holocaust. 11 million innocent men, women, and children were systematically stripped of their rights and sent to their deaths. Political opponents, writers, thinkers, <coughs> homosexuals, Jehovah's Witnesses, gypsies, Slavs, the disabled, all fell prey to Hitler's worldview. Of those who were murdered, six million were Jewish. One and a half million of those were children under the age of 16. Anne Frank 
was only one of those. Anne's diary has enduring significance as one of the very first written accounts to be published post-World War II to introduce the world to one family's experience during the tragic years of Nazi tyranny. And I emphasize that she was one child among many because, again, we shouldn't take Anne's story as, as the norm because it really had so many abnormal qualities to it that we can't just lump all of, all of those who lost their lives together. What makes Anne's story so powerful is not so much the uniqueness, but the, the connection, the fact that we know it, the fact that we can see a little piece of ourselves in Anne as we get to know her through her diary. And so for every Anne Frank that we get to know, that we get to identify with, that we get to say, oh yeah, you know, I had, a, I had a perfect older sister growing up who was always doing everything right and I was always doing everything wrong and, and I can sympathize with how Anne is feeling here. That, that one connection that we make, how can we possibly consider multiplying that times 1.5 million? How can we possibly consider multiplying that times 11 million? We can't. The, the numbers are, are, are too astronomical and, and too so completely out of proportion. So what becomes very essential in, in trying to understand a, a Holocaust and, and, and any genocide is connecting with those individuals whose stories we can know, getting to know their lives, getting to know their uniqueness, getting to understand who they were as people. And rather than talk about numbers and, and, and statistics to talk about the actual facts and the actual identities of the few who were lucky enough to have been able to get to know. Anne's diary has that enduring significance and as I said was one of the very first written accounts to be published because remember after the war most people the last thing they wanted to do was talk more about the war. And even for people who, who survived, who were, were survivors of the Holocaust and came to this country, for so many of them, they didn't speak at all about what happened. They felt afraid, they felt uncomfortable, and for most of them, they wanted so desperately to protect their children from what they had experienced. And so for many children growing up in this country, a lot of them, didn't really understand what their parents had gone through. Um, and it's only later in life when they start to explore their family's history that they actually come across uh, some of the, the details that they had been sheltered from growing up. When we read Anne's diary, like so many people her age, we feel that Anne's desire for independence and her desire to be respected for who she is, not what others labeled her as. One almost cannot help falling in love with Anne through her candid moments of self-discovery and introspection, her adoration of her father, her stormy relationship with her mother, her fears, her frustrations, and her wonderful sense of humor. She struggled to stay hopeful in the face of despair, dreaming someday of becoming a writer, a dream that would be brought to fruition by her father's courageous decision to publish her diary after the war. I think um, I want to talk a little bit about the actual publication of the diary itself because I, uh, you know, I spoke earlier and mentioned that there, Anne's diary is one of the most widely read works of nonfiction in the world. The fact that it's been published in 68 different foreign languages. And the fact that when Otto Frank first attempted to have this document published, he was told no by a lot of people. And throughout Holland, uh, you know, as, as cultured and, and as, uh, as, you know, diverse as that country is, even there, people were very reluctant to, to talk about something so horrible and so tragic. Even though none of the horror is depicted directly in Anne's diary, she references it and, and, and she she imagines what might be happening, and, and of course she has these horrible feelings of guilt, but we don't actually get the, the really rough evil that we hear about more directly from some other survivors who have written books. And you know, for, if you compare Anne's diary, it's really a very, 
gentle look at what was going on. Um, and I think this is a great credit to Otto Frank's strength and, and his desire, not only to make his daughter's dream come true, but also to really spread Anne's message of, of hope and, and the dream of, of being treated as, as a normal person rather than a stereotype. Um, Otto Frank really bought into that and it became more and more his life's passion. The older he got, the more involved he became in, in eventually founding the Anne Frank House and creating a organization which would be tasked with forever carrying on his daughter's legacy. Anne's legacy, I think, really challenges each of us to ask ourselves, what can we do to challenge prejudice and discrimination, both within ourselves and within our schools, within our family, within our society? Do we look the other way, or are we willing to take a stand against intolerance and violence? In this world, where people are discriminated against based on race, religion, ethnic backgrounds, gender, sexual orientation, mental and physical ability, how can each one of us work to eliminate discrimination and hatred? How can we create in our lives a community where the dignity of human life is valued and where differences strengthen rather than en and enrich our lives rather than tearing the fabric of our lives apart? And that question is something that I will pose to students as young as eight years old. Because if you ask a little kid, have you ever experienced intolerance? Have you ever experienced hate? A lot of them will say yes. And as awful as that is, it's something that we all need to address. The fact that every single day when, you know, you send your younger siblings, or if you're a parent, if you send your kid to school, they might experience bullying. They might experience racism. They might watch as some kid who, you know, for whatever reason is, is getting picked on. Maybe he's not wearing the, you know, very cool sneakers, or, or maybe he speaks with a, a stutter, or, or for whatever reason is, is being pushed aside. And what does that teach that kid? that it's okay to discriminate, that it's okay to judge others who don't look like you or who have different beliefs than you. And when we start thinking about, you know, broadening the context and think about, you know, what do kids watch on TV these days? What do we see in the movies? What do we see even in the newspaper? A lot of it really revolves around the idea that it's okay to draw distinctions between people who are different than you. And very rarely do we celebrate the diversity that we're so lucky to have here in this country. So I think what it comes down to, for me at least, in light of all of this, is the idea and really the, the question of why. Why do we teach Anne Frank? Why do we talk about Anne Frank in the classroom? Why do we teach her story? And the answer to that really lies in the little kid getting picked on the playground. Do you think that that is natural for a little kid to judge like that? It's not. Hate is taught. Racism is taught. Intolerance is taught. Nobody comes into this world believing, as Hitler did, that there are inferior um, people who belong in some sort of suboptimal world where they're less, where they're subhuman, where they are a lesser species. That thinking, that belief, has to begin somewhere. It has to be taught because it doesn't exist when we were first born. And that, that knowledge that somewhere out there little kids are still being taught to hate is why it is so imperative for each and every one of us to remember Anne Frank's story, to remember what it means to stand up, and remember 
how important it is when we can do something as simple as help an old woman carry her groceries across the street. If we see in our daily lives somebody getting picked on or, or abused in some way, to stand up and say, no, that's wrong. How brave is it? I know that a lot of you are probably a lot younger than me, but it wasn't that long ago when we were all sitting in the seventh and eighth grade you know, cafeteria having lunch, and how brave would it have been for one of us to ask one of the uncool kids to sit with us at lunch? It's a hard thing to do, but if each day we can commit one of those acts of kindness and make a difference in someone's lives, then those little ripples of goodness will radiate out from each one of us. And we need for those ripples to be there because we need them to counteract all of the acts of discrimination and all of the acts of hatred that are being committed at the same time. And our hope is that eventually there will be only good ripples and not hate-filled ones. So I encourage all of you to join with the Anne Frank Center and with Sonoma State University in this noble pursuit of bringing Anne Frank into your lives and to helping to share her legacy with everyone in your world. I thank you all very much and would invite anyone who has questions or comments or anything they'd like to ask to raise your hand and I'll get to as many people as I can. Thank you.
first edition was edited by Robert Frank. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Did you want to? There, uh, yes, uh, there, there is a rather complex history to the publication of Anne's Diary, and thank you for bringing that up. The, um, the original edition that was first published by Otto Frank in 1947 was, it was abridged, and the definitive edition uh, did not get published until after Otto Frank's death and, and includes most of uh, the pages, at least all of the ones that were known about, that Otto Frank had, had taken out. When Otto Frank first published Anne's Diary, he elected to edit out some passages where Anne was saying not too nice things about her mother and about her parents' marriage. And for Otto Frank, I think what, what he felt was that had Anne survived the Holocaust and been given the opportunity to, to make these edits herself, that she would have, in fact, chosen to, to remove them simply because what you say about your mom when you're 14 years old is not necessarily what you think of your mom when you're, say, 24 years old or 34 years old. Uh, so to his credit, I, I think he was, he was thinking more of Anne than, um, than he was of, of himself. Another interesting thing to point out about Anne's diary is that Anne herself actually had several versions of the diary. If you recall in the video, there is a point where the Dutch uh, war minister announces that they're going to be collecting these, these war documents and, um, you know, sort of using them to tell the story of the Dutch people during World War II. And at that point, Anne decides, okay, I'm going to publish my diary. And she goes back and starts rewriting all of the entries to her, to her diary in addition to continuing to add new entries. And so what has happened is that there, there are now two versions of Anne's writing. One, which is called the A version, is Anne's, Anne's original diary. And then the second, the B version, is Anne going back and re-editing her own work with the idea now that she's going to be a published author. So initially, when, when Anne first writes, it's very much a, a little girl writing in her diary. The B version is very much intended for an outside audience. Um, she also, at this point, goes back and changes the names of the people in hiding. Of course, she wants to protect the identity of everyone there, even after the war. Anne doesn't know if it's going to be safe to talk about the fact that you hit a Jew during, during the Holocaust. That, that may be detrimental. And so she changes Meep's name. She changes Johannes Kleinman and Victor Kugler's names. She changes all the names of people in hiding. She's trying to protect everyone. Um, but I, I think uh, what's, what's really fascinating is that she's taking it upon herself to go back and, and edit her work, which is something that, as an educator, I, I struggle with continuously, getting students to, to take the initiative and, and go back and, and reread re their work and, and make changes on their own. Um, and then there's a third version, the C version, which is what ended up being published by Otto Frank. Um, and for the most part, stays very true to, to Anne's writing, with those few exceptions that I mentioned. Yeah? Where are the um, diary um, her other papers <coughs> kept uh, All of Anne's papers that were recovered are on display at the Anne Frank House in Amsterdam. And uh, Otto Frank actually stipulated in his will that Anne's diary should always remain in the country and was never to leave. Uh, it's actually the property of, of the uh, um, the uh, Institute for War Documentation in, in Amsterdam. But what they did do was uh, create a few uh, very exact replicas or facsimiles of Anne's diary. And uh, so one of those is on display at our center in New York City. And then I think there was another one created for the Anne Frank Trust in London and uh, a third one for uh, the Anne Frank Funds in Basel. So uh, each of the three organizations has a facsimile, but the original one is only in the house. And it's also, um, I don't know if you all are aware of this, but it's also very likely that a lot of what Anne wrote was actually never recovered, simply because, you know, we all know the, the iconic red plaid diary, but that didn't last for very long. And so after she filled that up, she started writing in 
accounting books, loose leaf paper, uh, steno paper, anything that Anne could find to write on. Their paper was not you know, something to be taken for granted during wartime. It was very difficult to find. And so a lot of what Anne ended up writing uh, was in a very loose format. And it's very possible that uh, some, of the, some of the pages that she wrote were, were never recovered after the Nazis ransacked the city limits. There's always going to be speculation. Uh, facts are few and far between. Uh, what I can tell you is that, well, A, whoever did it is probably no longer with us. Um, I, I believe that it was, there was a man who was brought to trial for betraying the Frank family and for making that phone call. However, since in you know, the 1940s we didn't have great things like caller ID and, and digital recording, there's, there's really no way to prove that you were the person that picked up the phone and dialed. And of course, you know, the Nazis, while they did keep very tight records, um, there were a lot of records that were never found and so whoever got paid off for betraying the Frank family, there was no record of that. And that would have been the key piece of evidence that was needed, and that never came to light. So that was sort of what prevented um, people from making a case. It's said, and again, this is all speculation, that Meep Geese knew uh, who made the phone call, but Meep never said anything along the lines of, of who it was. Uh, but people do speculate that it was one of the factory workers simply because when the Nazis arrived to make the arrest, they knew to go up to the second floor and they knew to go to that bookcase and they knew to pull that bookcase open. So it is believed to have been one of the factory workers by many people, but again, as far as proof, we'll never have any. Would you just in closing say a few words about me? Yes. She is, um, since past. Yes. She is a remarkable example of someone who stood up personal courage and who stood up. Yes. I think uh, you know, when I think of Meep Geese, the first thing I, I think about is uh, her her interview where she was speaking with the press and somebody said to her, you know, Meep, how does it feel to be a hero? And her response was, I'm not a hero. I'm, I'm just a normal person who, who did something to help someone they cared about. And I, I really feel like Meep's outlook on, and on what happened is very important because it sort of opens up the idea that, that anyone can be a hero. Um, and when we look back, on what we did, not only was she the person who was primarily responsible for feeding these eight people in hiding. Remember, there was no, you couldn't buy food because there was none, so she had to go on the black market and basically use illegal means to, to obtain food for eight people. She was the person who brought uh, correspondence courses for, for the girls and for, for Peter. She was the person who brought school clothes um, certainly the girls and, and Peter were growing at a, at a fast rate. They were adolescents and, and Meek did everything she could to get them clothes that fit. And she was the person who, who brought the news, what was going on, what was happening in the outside world. Um, and for each and every one of those things that she did, she was risking her life. Because had she been caught, she would have been arrested and most likely sent to, to jail and even a, in a, a concentration camp. Not only was Meep hiding <coughs> people in the back of her office, unbeknownst to Otto Frank, she was also hiding a Jewish person in her home. And so it was amazing to, to look <coughs> back on, on Meep's story, and I encourage all of you, if, if you get a chance to read her book, which is entitled Anne Frank Remembered, where she talks about sort of the other half, what was happening beyond the walls of the secret annex, and 
uh, the struggles that, that she went through, and a little bit of insight into Meep's consciousness, which is, you know, someone comes to you and, and says, I need your help, what, what are you going to do? You're going to do it because it's your friend. And while I never <coughs> want anyone to take it very lightly, that it was like, oh, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll risk my life for you, no problem. <laughs> that, that wasn't at all what, how it happened. Uh, I think it, it is sort of interesting how me conceptualize this, this decision. And, and you know, again, when, when the press would, would question her, what went through your mind when, when Otto Frank confronted you and, and said, would you hide my family? Me again, would always downplay that, that response and, and say <coughs> nothing. Nothing went through my mind. I, I knew immediately that I was going to help them because they're my friends and, and I cared about them and, and that's what friends do. So the power of the individual, not something to be undermined and always something to be looked up to. Yes? Didn't you play a crucial role in supporting Otto Frank when he came back? Yes. And, you know, there, there are certainly lots of information about him essentially living with her for many years. And While that, he was getting back on his feet. And crucial link in helping in his recovery so that he's actually able to, to take that next daughter. step. Yeah. Meep, um, Meep and her husband uh, took care of Otto Frank when he came back from the war, and, and that's where he was on the day when uh, someone came and, and knocked on the door and says, I, I know what happened to, to your daughters. Um, Meep was there for all of that. And um, I, I think for sure it's, it's very possible that had Otto Frank not had the, that support and, and that person to go to, because remember when, when the Jews returned from the camps, there was nothing. There was somebody else living in your apartment. There was somebody else with your stuff. And if you went there and said, hi, this is my home, I live here, you were told, sorry, not anymore, now it's mine. And so for people that didn't have the amazing support structure that, that Otto Frank had, it's, it's certainly very possible that things would have come out a little bit differently than they had. Yeah? Was it common to keep the records that they did of prisoners being first in one location and then another? Yes. The, uh, that even that, that information is... <coughs> we have, yeah, we have records of uh, the last shipment of Jews that left Westerbork, and it was in fact the very last train to go from Westerbork to Auschwitz that had Anne Frank and her family on it, and that was pretty common. There are records to record of that. individuals and how many um, bugs they have in the camps. There were people who kept track of how many lights were on the people. The Germans were. Yeah. Keep in mind too the yeah the, the, the I, there was sort of like a science that that people were kind of clinging to the idea of, of eugenics was was very much alive not only in Europe but but here in the United States and it was actually being taught at at prestigious universities in this country so for for many people this you know this sort of overwhelming desire to record facts. Was, was because they were trying to prove, look, you know, people with this type of characteristic are on this level, and people with this type of characteristic are on this level. They, were, they really believed that there was some type of science behind what they were doing, and this, this data that they were supposedly collecting was, was gonna prove uh, the, the science of, of what they were you know, doing, which was it, eventually genocide. Yeah. It also created jobs. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Do you find that um, the Diary of Anne Frank is in most school curriculums? How many, how many students here read the Diary of Anne Frank in school? Oh, wow. That's great. That's very nice. Um, no, I do not find that it's in most schools. I find that it's in some schools. Um, keep in mind that um, 
schools in, in New York and California are far more likely to be reading the Diary of Anne Frank than schools in other parts of this country, and that other parts of this country are, are very big. Uh, so, um, and, and even you know, in, in exotic places like New Jersey, uh, where I know the Holocaust and the genocide is, is, is required, um, Anne Frank's diary is not. So students will actually um, be reading things like Elie Wiesel's Night, um, in high school or um, elementary school will often assign them to the stars. Thank you very much.